Why don't we start with a brief overview uh, for our listeners, highlighting the key recommendations, and perhaps we can focus a little bit more on the catalyst that brought this research about. Uh, certainly, Miles. Uh, happy to, and and thank you very much for the opportunity to uh, reach your audience. Jim and I, uh, really from very different backgrounds, uh, have talked about for uh, some time uh, an obvious issue, which is how did we get to where we are? How did this happen? How is it that China could rise year after year and nothing is done about it? Uh, Washington, D.C. has uh, a robust intelligence community, of course, military looking at threats around the world. Think tanks, uh, obviously devoted to strategic thought, and yet year after year, uh, the enemy arose, each year becoming stronger, while the United States did nothing uh, to stop it uh, or to act uh, in response, really until the Trump administration, as you well know, of course, uh, where many uh, measures were taken uh, to address the threat posed uh, by our enemy, uh, the Chinese Communist Party. So uh, we decided to write a book on it. Again, our backgrounds became such a – we always say that we're like peanut butter and chocolate, right, Jim, That uh, to uh, produce uh, the book. Uh, and we're very grateful, of course, to have the opportunity to work with, of course, our publisher and to Steve Bannon uh, for providing the foreword uh, to the book. I'm going to ask you which one of you is peanut butter, which one is chocolate, but Jim. Yeah, clearly today, by every measure – across all domains of, of national power, China is a peer competitor or a, a, a leader against us in many areas. For instance, they have the largest navy in the world today. How did that happen? How is it possible that we went from 25 years ago when the Congressional Research Service said that the U.S. Navy was 76 major combatants larger than the PLA Navy, and today that's flipped and rever in, inverted, and China is ahead of the United States by a greater number, much greater number. So we're in a position where China has been able to achieve great strength, and we wanted to know why did that happen? How is it possible that that happened? And there's a lot of reasons that we go through in the book, uh, but one of them is is based upon this idea that you know we deflated the threat, the intelligence community largely, uh, but also from our think tanks and the academic community downplayed the threat of the Chinese for the Chinese Communist Party uh, for these mis, you know, past 30 plus years. And so we it, it kind of inculcated our culture in the national security community that when we saw something from China, whether it was you know, in 2013 when I was still on active duty watching the first indications of building seven islands in the Spratleys, the natural inclination of the IC and the establishment – national security community was to kind of just ignore that and to say, well, that's probably nothing. Don't worry about it. Then when they were built, then they were said, well, they're not going to militarize them because she told Obama that. And yet, you know, every time we're, it, there was a consistent pattern of underestimating the PRC, underestimating their intentions. And so that's part of the, the rational or, or part of the explanation of why we're in this position. Brad can talk more about the Deng and what his strategy uh, did and how brilliant it was. But we're finding ourselves in a place today that we have to acknowledge that we missed this. If we don't acknowledge that we missed this, then we can't move forward like we were able to do in the Cold War with the Soviets. Yeah. That's a very important. I read your book and I think that one of the most important things is that uh, our nation right now is in a stage of uh, how to counter China threat. But uh, I don't think the, there is enough reflection on what had gone wrong uh, in order to come up with a better strategy. History is a prologue. Uh, if you don't understand history, we cannot do things right p at present, and we can definitely uh, uh, not win the future. So that's why I think your book is very, very important. But of course, let's just say uh, it's not necessarily a blame game. It, we're all responsible for this. Uh, this nation is very good at... Uh, reflecting on what went wrong after a catastrophic uh, strike uh, like Pearl Harbor, like 9-11. But sometimes we had to figure out uh, what has to be done to change your habit of doing things. So um, one of the things that you talked about quite a bit, uh, it's very interesting, is, uh, is the alliance structure uh, in containing the PRC and Xi Jinping. Can America alone stand up to the PRC if some of our strategic allies are not on board? What can be done 
to appeal to them. Alliance insurance is very critical. U.S., we say we have a lot of uh, allies of the world, which is definitely a strength to our own uh, system. China does not have it, but China is actively seeking new alliances with North Korea, with Iran, with Russia in particular, right? So with some of the countries in the middle who are struggling, uh, struggling, I should say. What's your take on that alliance? Can we do it alone? Well, uh, Miles, a very important issue because uh, the United States has to fight the CCP, not by itself, but with allies around the world. Part of the genesis of the book was to do that, if you will, analysis about why we failed. Allies want to have confidence in the United States and confidence that the United States is able to discern threats clearly uh, and act robustly against them. And as we uh, document in the book, we didn't do that for a generation. While countries, partners like India or uh, key allies like Japan were left scratching their heads figuratively, uh, thinking through why is the United States not taking the steps necessary to deal with what is for them as well as for the United States an imminent security threat. And so the issue really becomes down to allies are important, but allies have to have confidence in American willpower and American strategic sagacity, which is so important. And so analyzing why we failed and coming out with an analysis that this is why we did, and we're, we're quite happy to recognize that the engagement school, of course, became so damaging and contributed to what we call in the book threat deflation, where again, year after year, we're deflating the threat, we're dismissing it uh, again because of the genius of Deng Xiaoping and the Chinese Communist Party strategy, uh, which is commonly called hide and bide, right? But an expert political warfare strategy that was able to make Wall Street, uh, universities, of course, uh, think tanks, his partner, actually partners with the Chinese Communist Party uh, to support their rise uh, and to fund it, uh, actually, and to allow increasing trade ties, entry into the World Trade Organization, which led to their rocket fuel uh, and incredible growth, which then, of course, was able to uh, transfer into military power, diplomatic might, uh, and in technological might and so many other areas. So our allies want to look for the United States for confidence, leadership. Uh, and that leadership requires recognizing that uh, the mistakes that we made in the past were correcting. And we're moving away from an engagement strategy towards one of recognizing the enemy for what he is and taking measures against them. So. With respect to this issue, of course, allies are critical and partners are critical. Partners like Taiwan and India, uh, again, are, are, are extremely important in every sense. In a military sense, they provide Beijing with a multiple front war problem uh, and complicate their strategic calculus. In the economic sense, of course, our allies aid us in so many ways through uh, trade, through security relationship and other partnerships that we're able to form with them. Their location, of course, is so important in a geostrategic sense, but also in a political warfare sense. Most importantly, the dispositive question of the 21st century is going to be whether the CCP, the Chinese Communist Party, defines the 21st century as one of a century defined by tyranny, the tyranny that they represent, or whether it's going to be decided by the United States and freedom and the international order that the United States created with, in conjunction with the British and that so many allies enjoined uh, in the decades afterwards is sustained, uh, which is so important. So allies need to see America's leadership and they need to have confidence in the United States and they need to also recognize, of course, that now is the time to support the U.S., uh, and to encourage the United States, the Biden administration uh, in particular, to take many measures against uh, the Chinese Communist Party, ideally to evict them from power, uh, of course. But that political warfare component is so important because the United States has so many advantages, allies around the world, obviously not just in the Indo-Pacific, uh, but around the world who have, if you will, voted with their feet. Uh, in conjunction with standing with the United States and not being enticed away 
uh, by the promises of uh, Belt and Road Initiative or other measures that Beijing uh, undertakes uh, to undermine the United States. You mentioned about uh, American leadership. You cannot say there is no American leadership during the Trump administration. We led the way to uh, change the global dialogue on China. We make China the number one national security threat to the United States, uh, by extension also to the world. Many of our allies are not with us, particularly some of the European countries. Uh, so they have a profound suspicion about our motives, and they try to be very opportunistic. They actually uh, overjoyed by the tension of China and the United States. So they could sign separate, separate uh, trade deals uh, with China. So let China play one against each other. So transatlantic relationship was not really that smooth, right? So Jim, you live in Europe, in a wonderful country with Switzerland, uh, with a uh, wonderful tradition of neutrality. Um, so when I say friend and allies, that kind of opportunistic, I didn't mean to say Switzerland. Um, <laughs> You have big countries like France, like the UK. Yeah, they were not with us 100. percent I mean, I just read the report this morning. There was a, a, a report from the Parliament, I believe. They're saying the British arms dealers, the British government, was supplying China with all the highly advanced weapons. Well, in the meantime, they uh, they seem to be on our side. So that's the problem with Allah. So leadership, yes. Uh, but I think that more importantly, is really a coalition of willing, and you have to really share some kind of common methods. In the Cold War, which is much easier for us to fight the Soviets, because Soviet system was completely separate from the rest of the world, the free trade system. We had the Paris Coordinating Committee, COCOM, to exercise, to exercise all the Western democracies' export control to the Eastern Bloc. Now we can the United States can impose sanctions, however severe we do, but our friends and allies do not necessarily go along with us. And however, most of friends and allies we have had in the world are the victims of Chinese Communist Party's aggression. Japan, India, Vietnam, uh, South Korea, Philippines. Philippines. So they are the ones that have no uh, ambiguity about uh, taking side on the United States. That's where I think leadership really matters. And I think we're, we're showing that more and more. And I just came back from Europe. Um, I feel very strongly. I went to Eastern Europe, right? I went to Czech Republic. Absolutely 100% with us. Very strong. I went to some other Western countries. Uh, they have their strategic autonomy. You never know what how their mind works. I agree. That's my experience living in Europe. It's exactly... In the West, in the West, they'll have their strategic interests, and they'll play you play off one against the other. In the book, we do very much uh, point out that it was the Trump administration that broke this headlock, if you will, uh, that the engagement community had on U.S.-China relations. That it, you know, just everything was, as former Secretary of State Pompeo said, blind engagement. I like the phrase unaccountable, unconstrained and unaccountable engagement. We had that policy for so many years and you guys broke that. And we started to see things in the alliance structure change. Like for instance, the reinvigoration of Quad. That was something that really took off. Yeah. And now it's because of the return, as we call neo-engagement with the Biden administration, we're watching these things erode in front of our faces. And right now we're facing probably one of the most critical challenges is with the Philippines. And, the, right. and 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 they are Beijing is knuckling down on the Philippines, and what's happened now over the weekend is is that we're watching President Marcos have to back off and say, well, we're not going to manage any more resupplies to Second Thomas Shoal to the Sierra Madre unless it's approved by the president. So Beijing got what it wanted. It escalated this very tactical issue that's been being done for 25 years, the resupply of a, a rusted out World War II amphibia ship, now it's become a presidential issue, which is what, exactly what Beijing wants. They want to stick the knife and divide Philippine politics, and that's starting to happen. Yeah. And it's because, as Brad said, our leadership was lacking because we were ambiguous uh, about how to characterize China. We wanted to have, this administration says they want to, you know, compete and cooperate. And you can't do both when somebody says they want to destroy you, which is what the, the Chinese Communist Party says they want to do to the United States. You're absolutely right. I think, you know, uh, um, you notice that uh, China actually uh, like to bully particular countries with uh, some unique uh, um, ties with the United States. 
first of all, they, they bullied Japan, would not fail, and they bullied South Korea. They played South Korea brilliantly, uh, particularly during the Park administration, and uh, we almost lost South Korea because they played South Korea against Japan and therefore the United States. And now, South Korea didn't yield for the most part, particularly on key issues like a thought, uh, missile defense uh, system deployment, they didn't give up um, to Chinese uh, bully. And now the Philippines, they consider as the weakest. If you consider all the three countries, because those are only three countries in Asia that have mutual defense arrangement in the United States. So their ultimate enemy is the United States. They try to isolate the United States, try to kick us out of the East Asia and South Asia. This is exactly what Japanese uh, imperialists were doing in the 30s. Uh, they want to establish some kind of a greater um, co-prosperity sphere for East Asia. Once they, they realize the United States would not allow you to do it, and they basically want to eliminate the United States. That's why Pearl Harbor took place. China, I think, is very much repeating that, that course. So let's just move on a little bit. Uh, you talk about uh, the issue of domestic politics, uh, the Wall Street in your book about uh, how the domestic economic sector, uh, manufacturing sector, influences American policy toward China, both in historic terms and in contemporary terms. Uh, what's your take on that? What's your recommendation on that? Well, it, indeed it does. And, and uh, again, it was only the Trump administration that took measures to fight engagement, uh, this uh, pernicious idea. Uh, which still governs uh, the Biden administration in its relationship with uh, uh, the Chinese Communist Party uh, and the PRC. Uh, Wall Street, of course, is key uh, to the story. Uh, when we're looking at how the United States made its greatest strategic failure, it made it because the Clinton administration recognized that they could open the doors through most favored nation trade status, permanent most favored nation trade status, which they recognized after two good years of the Clinton administration. If you remember, Miles, as I do, the 92 campaign where Clinton Gore said that they were criticizing the Bush administration for coddling dictators from Baghdad to Beijing. And for two years, of course, they worked with Nancy Pelosi, who at the time, of course, was very strong on human rights uh, in, uh, in the wake of Tiananmen, to ensure that there were a year-to-year -year, uh, renewal of most favored nation trade status. Well, the Clinton administration recognized uh, that they could tap into that wealth uh, as Wall Street was tapping in with investment uh, and trade into uh, China profiting enormously, shifting American jobs from the United States, from Indiana, Ohio, of course, uh, throughout the United States into the People's Republic of China, decimating American economy uh, in uh, the guise of essentially engagement. A key idea also in the book is we talk about the end of history moment. And there was Francis Fukuyama's famous, famous argument he made in 1989 and then in a book in 1992 where he said, of course, that history was at an end in a Hegelian sense and that we knew what worked. That was democracy and uh, capitalist economics. And that was uh, essentially the political system and economic system that would disseminate throughout the world. All countries were on the path to democracy uh, and uh, capitalist systems. Of course, China didn't get the word. The Chinese Communist Party was determined to make, of course, their new economic policy to open up, to allow Wall Street to come in, the South Koreans, the Japanese, the Europeans, and so many others, but to allow the Chamber of Commerce, uh, if you will, to pave the way for American industry to move in and shift manufacturing uh, to uh, People's Republic of China, which was disastrous for us in so many respects. So that sadly still continues, where there still is, despite uh, obviously a recognition that it's easy to get into China, but it's hard to get out uh, of China with your investment. It set the stage for, again, this generational period, Miles, of where wealth was transferred, knowledge was transferred by legal and illegal means uh, to the PRC to allow them, again, to, uh, to grow their economy and convert that to military power. So that problem remains. Uh, with us today, we still, through new engagement, 
have not addressed the fundamental issue that's the cause of our greatest strategic failure, which is the need to separate the United States, its wealth, its intellectual knowledge, its investment, its trade uh, from the People's Republic of China. Let me just want to clarify about the Trump administration's policy toward China. We're not really about anti-engagement. Uh, engagement is good. You cannot ignore China. But engagement not on China's terms. What Trump uh, administration tried to do, particularly Secretary Pompeo tried to do uh, very clearly, is that we do not want to engage China on Chinese terms. That, that is, only certain areas that we can engage, right? Trade, technological transfer, uh, cultural exchange. But on, in so many other aspects, we're not allowed to engage China. On uh, human rights, industrial and military espionage, intellectual property rights, global security, Taiwan Strait. Those were the forbidden areas we're not supposed to touch. That was the framework of 1972 set up by Richard Nixon and Henry Kissinger with Chinese leadership. So what the Trump administration wanted to do is that we want to engage China full spectrum. Every aspect that involves the U.S.-China relationship, and that is very critical to not only to U.S. national interest but global security, we have to engage China. Right? You cannot expect the United States to say nothing when the Chinese government lock up one million Uyghurs in the concentration camp. You cannot, the United States, not engage you on your obligation of liberty, autonomy of Hong Kong, right? You cannot really not allow the United States to engage you on issues like regional security, bullying Taiwan, bullying South Korea, bullying Japan. So those are things that we all want to engage with you. And so that's the root of the tension between U.S. and China during the Trump administration because China does not want to be treated like any other unique, uh, uh, any other normal country. They want to take advantage of the United States' uh, uh, sort of a, a goodwill and naivete, if you might say, but we insist on something that's very, very decent, which is full-spectrum engagement with China. People often misunderstood the Trump administration as a very radical right-wing or left-wing, uh, some kind of emotional um, reaction to global affairs without calculation. No. The Trump administration foreign policy is a radically moderate. We go back to the basic. We go back to the first principle of governance, domestic and foreign. The problem, it, it, when we say and talk about the engagement school and the engagement strategy being a death death knell for the United States up to this point, it's not that we say zero engagement. I use the phrase unconstrained and unaccountable. We do not, and we have not for 40 years, had accountability for our engagement. For instance, when you read the annual DOD report to Congress on the state of the PLA, you go back and read Appendix A, or I, th I think it's Appendix A every year. It lists all the engagements, literally. And I, and I, I was involved with this. The Navy, the Army, the Air Force, the Marine Corps have engagements with the PRC from the comm commanders of each of those individual services all the way down. And then it goes across from the N1, the administrators, the N2s have engagements, the N3s, the operators, the N4, the N5, the N6. And you play that across all the services. And then you go out to Indo-PACOM and they have the same thing in the J codes, J1234. All everybody is engaging and that's just the Department of Defense. Add in State Department, add in Treasury, add in Commerce, add in all, you know, FBI, GOJ. You have a nation that's out of control with engagement. So, so we agree with you. There should be engagement with China, but it should be very much controlled, limited, and with very specific measurable accountability points, which no administration until the Trump administration had ever done. And we are back into full-scale, full-throated uh, engagement again. The gravy train of the think tanks and governments, you know, there used to be what you talked about, a conga line for the, the generals and the admirals to go to China. They just wanted to get their trip to China so that they could check it off and say, I've been to China. And it was never measured against so, General, what does this trip to China do for U.S. national security? And when we were talking about economics in, the, in this vein, just recall, we are now facing the Chinese Navy that's larger than ours. And that growth came from the economy of Western firms going into China and helping them build their Navy. 
Just go back and look at what happened. You know, every year in Mar or in, in March, they have the National People's Congress, and the Chinese government always puts out their projection for their GDP growth for the year and what their PL, uh, de defense spending will be on the PLA. Remember in 2020, they delayed the, the MPC to May because of COVID. And for the first time in 28 years, the Chinese Communist Party could not tell the world what the GDP growth for the PRC would be for that year. But you know what they could tell the world? We will grow the PLA by 6%. They always prioritize spending on the PLA, and we are living under the results of that. Not only do they have the largest Navy, in the last three and a half years, they built 350 ICBM silos in central and western China that have put American citizens across this fruited plain at risk. Air Force, cyber, the whole works because they are, as they call it, comprehensive national power. And while they'd like to get what they can get through nonviolent means, they have prepared themselves to use violence. And we are not prepared for that. So when I, you know, when we talk about engagement, that's fine. But let's not let's not deceive ourselves. We have to have a calculated strategy. Uh, you guys in the Trump administration brought back the word reciprocity. There has to be these hardball uh, measures when we come to, to talk with the Chinese. Yeah. Just to talk for talking's sake is useless. Yeah. It's actually worse than useless. It is just, it has destroyed our advantage that we had coming out of World War II and in the Pax Americana that we had. Yeah. Well, I just want to add two points to to all the mm -hmm. points that you and uh, Brad made over there. Uh, I will even go even beyond the, the COVID, beyond the Deng Xiaoping time, beyond the even, um, you know, uh, Mao, right? If you look at the uh, Chinese Communist Party rule uh, in the last uh, close to 75 years, is uh, basically a, a sad history of chaos, atrocities, uh, and basically political turmoils. But the one consistency, and that is the People's Liberation Army, particularly in their arms development, mm -hmm. armament, has never stopped. Even during the height of Cultural Revolution, China never stopped its development of nuclear bombs, hydrogen bombs, and satellites, and space programs. They actually advanced. So that is consistency. Despite all these political turmoils, these catastrophes, pogroms going on. So that's why military strength is essential to the Chinese Communist Party's high command. Number two, you talk about the engagement with calculated uh, 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 awareness, alertness, that's true. But remember, I'm not here to distract uh, uh, Richard Nixon. Richard Nixon was brilliant when he was not in office, okay? He had the hiatus between uh, the defeat uh, by uh, Senator Kennedy in 1960s and he came back to win in 1968. So toward the end of 1960s, about 65, 60, uh, 66, particularly after the Cultural Revolution, Richard Nixon believed China was a country that got mad. There was a cultural revolution was totally very, very uh, disruptive and a threat to, uh, to the, uh, the global peace. So he de de developed the idea of engagement, but engagement with a purpose. The purpose was to induce change. He wrote a very famous article in Foreign Affairs in 1967, before the election. He said, we got to engage China. I isolated China is dangerous to global peace. We have to engage China to induce change. I'm fully for that. When he got into office, he forget the, the purpose of that engagement. He wanted to engage China for the sake of engagement, to get the U.S. out of the Vietnam War, some of the very immediate things to play the China card. China never become the ultimate destination. A purpose of the American policy toward China is, is a conduit through which to reach some other goals, defeat the Soviet Union, get U.S. out of Vietnam. And so... That's what happened during the Trump administration. Secretary Pompeo gave a brilliant speech in July 2020 at Nixon Library to basically contrast Nixon's approach to what needs to be done. He acknowledges the brilliance of Nixon's uh, approach to China. In the meantime, he, re he gave the new meaning to engagement, that is, with a purpose. With a purpose. The purpose is to facilitate change. Because if that regime in Beijing is not changed, that regime is going to change all of us. That's why engagement must have a purpose, in addition to be alert. We'd probably go a little bit to the point that is we did engage. 
and they didn't change our behavior. We have 40 plus years of evidence that shows that engagement did not change our behavior. And you just said what remained constant through 75 years, hard power. Yeah, uh, because because we give up the condition for engagement, right? Uh, you, uh, Brad, you mentioned about uh, President Clinton. It was President Clinton that made the devastating, catastroph catastrophic uh, decision to delink human rights uh, with trade. I mean, listen, human rights is such an important issue. Human rights was the beginning of the demise of Soviet empire. War started with 1976, the Helsinki Accords, because through that accord, we forced Soviet Union to engage the West on human rights, even though it's a very small basket of that mm -hmm. uh, accord, but it's the beginning. It was the beginning of engage for Soviet Union to, to deal with the real issue of human rights. And that's why we support the Saharov, we support Sharansky, we support Solidarity, all mm -hmm. started with that kind of a theoretical understanding. We forced Soviet Union to do this, and we don't have that. The last U.S. Assistant Secretary of State in charge of human rights to meet with the Chinese dissident in China was uh, Mr. John Shadak. That was during the Clinton administration. Ever since, no U.S. senior official until Secretary Pompeo is willing and courageous enough to meet Chinese dissidents. Period. That is basically absolutely atrocious to me. So uh, that's why uh, when Secretary Pompeo uh, uh, was in office <laughs> in the State Department, he made a virtue every group of dissident, in addition to meet with Chinese uh, diplomats, right? And senior officials. Um, he meet with people from, from Falun Gong, people from um, the Uyghur group, people from Tibet, people from Hong Kong, people from all the religious, uh, uh, religious persecuted people in, in China. He also met the scholars and scholars. And I knew this because I helped arrange all of this. That's if you want to classify that as engagement, I'm I'm with you. No, I, no, no. <laughs> engaging with the purpose, engaging yeah. with the confidence. Right. The United States has enormous impact upon uh, the Chinese government behavior. We have an enormous impact among Chinese people. Chinese people aspire to be treated with due respect, just like American U.S. citizens. We have such a powerful leverage. That leverage is there. We're never willing to use it. And that's the problem we have. So we should not be afraid of a Chinese communist regime. We should do it with confidence as American, be proud, and, uh, and we shall overcome. So our time is running out, but I have one question, last question for you, for both of you. If you could briefly summarize, from a domestic perspective, uh, especially given the pervasive CCP coercion campaigns uh, targeting American citizens, how can the U.S. counter the PRC's political warfare campaign that's been conducted on American soil. Well, it's a hugely important issue, and thank you for raising it. Uh, so much needs to be done in the realm of political warfare. Uh, what needs to be done, I identify, is really active measures of a, uh, really are offensive measures, the sword, but also the shield. We have to protect dissidents here in the United States from the operations of Fox Hunt and its derivatives and many other uh, steps that the PRC has taken. Uh, to reach into the United States to affect, to influence uh, directly and then indirectly, of course, uh, Chinese citizens, uh, dissidents, as well as Chinese Americans uh, in the United States. That has to be identified and that has to be stopped. Uh, individuals who come into the United States are protected and they have to feel that they're protected and they have to actually be protected from nefarious actors uh, uh, from the uh, Chinese Communist Party. But then offensively, right, we can see what Beijing has done with respect to laws, Hong Kong, what they're recently doing now in Taiwan in terms of talking about execution of those who uh, further uh, separatism as they identify miles. This has to be called out. Why is it that this regime is violating sovereignty of countries around the world while it proclaims, of course, that that's sacrosanct uh, in, its, uh, in its own mind? Uh, why is it that this regime has to suppress, crush, threaten, coerce dissidents, individuals who've left China, the Chinese diaspora? Why is it that they need to do that? They need to do it because they're illegitimate and they know they're illegitimate. And so calling attention to this, again, putting them on the back foot and seeing it reality as it is, is so important. 
Orwell had that great line, it takes the greatest effort to see what's in front of one's nose, right? Well, to see what's in front of our nose is that the regime is illegitimate. The Chinese Communist Party is illegitimate. And the U.S., its allies and partners around the world, as well as people of goodwill around the world, have to say so, uh, so uh, and act accordingly. Yeah, I, I'll take the military perspective on this, a pet peeve for me is that uh, you know one element of political warfare is information warfare and for too long you know we talk about the status quo in the in the in the in the far east in the taiwan strait and we have been losing the information war to the prc when it comes to talking about what's going on militarily and so i would like to see the us government in particular our military the department of defense to spend more time focusing on reporting on what the PLA is doing uh, in the Far East, like, for instance, what's happening down in the South China Sea. We get snippets from the Philippines. If a Chinese uh, carrier or a, or a Jin class SSBN transits through the Taiwan Strait, we'll get a report from Taiwan. If the, if the Chinese uh, surface action group goes outside the first island chain into the Philippine Sea, the Japanese will report on it. But we are still reluctant inside the Department of Defense and inside our government to report out on bad behavior of what the Chinese are doing. And sometimes it's just reporting out the facts of what they're doing. We should have been doing that two decades ago so that people could have the documents, the documented facts of how the status quo has been altered by the PRC. Our relationship uh, with the Taiwan is based upon there would be no change in the status quo by either side. Well, who's changed the status quo? It's been the PRC and the PLA. They've dramatically altered the military balance of power in, in the Western Pacific. Uh, and we have kind of sat there and just watched it inside closed channels, inside the classified world. But we haven't taken p the political warfare uh, and understood Chinese communist political warfare to the extent that we are in a battlefield to show and inform people of who's doing what. And so what happens, you know, China created the South China Sea Probing Initiative, a think tank that actually reports on American movements, and they are actually gaslighting the world by saying it's America that's the, the aggressor in Asia when it's actually the PLA that's the aggressor. Yeah. So we are, that's for me, that's a, a, a particular area that I hope that the, if there's a next Trump administration, that we can get to this idea of informing the world Really, we don't have to give up sources and methods. We can do this by a very discreet way of just did, uh, disciplined, did, uh, diligent reporting on what they're doing so that people can really around the world understand who the aggressor is. Yeah. Well, uh, Hudson Institute is a nonpartisan institute. So not only we hope next Trump administration, but also next Democratic uh, institution uh, uh, administration will also implement what you're just saying. So uh, our U.S. policy toward Taiwan, straight toward China, basically, is uh, use a force to change status quo. You, Jim, you just said something very, very important. That is, uh, uh, there are many ways to change the status quo, not necessarily by use of force, but also by use political warfare some other legal uh, lawfare. So we should oppose any attempts to change the status quo. Brad, you mentioned about uh, we have to figure out uh, what's uh, um, in front of our nose. Want to become a global communication leader? Six, the artificial intelligence and language technology will help you achieve your dreams. In this new era, the language barrier has been passed. We have launched the six artificial intelligence and language technology system. This is the most powerful tool for the European Union to develop the most powerful tool. 让你可以克隆自己的声音，并将文字转换成一百四十五种语言和方言，提升你的个人和职业生活。想象一下，你可以在日本参加商务会议，在巴西上课，或与意大利的朋友畅聊，而这一切都用你自己的声音、他们的语言进行。操作简单，只需点击几下，无需复杂的科技知识，就能享受无缝衔接的体验。让世界向你敞开，从商务到教育，从媒体到娱乐，应用场景无处不在。企业可以更好地与全球客户建立联系，教育机构可以提供多语言学习，媒体可以创作更丰富的内容，触达更广泛的受众。今天就来体验这项革命性技术吧！访问，迈向你的声音无国界的未来